morning, all. How are you guys doing? It's so good to have you guys with us. Uh, I have a sense that the Lord has something, some really important things for some of you. That, that um, today is going to be kind of the springboard moment. You know, if you've been journeying with us for the last seven weeks in the calling, maybe some of you have been sensing the Lord has got a unique calling upon my life. And today, more than anything, hopefully what I can do is just muster the encouragement within you and the Spirit of God will work within you to get you to jump off of, if you imagine like standing at the top of a, of a high dive and you're maybe a little nervous to jump off, that today you're just going to say it's time that we jump off into into the calling. And, and I just want to make a quick plug here. If you have been going through this series, or maybe you haven't, you're wondering, hey, can I do this with some friends? If there are any of you who are interested in launching small groups, or you want some more of those books, please go and grab Pastor Jeff. He would love to just in, empower you and equip you to be able to launch your own small group with the calling, uh, maybe with a group of your friends or people outside the church, and he'll give you all the video links and all that stuff so you can do that. So just go and talk with him if you have any questions about that. But today what I want to do is we kind of step up to the edge of the high dive and get ready to jump off, is I want to show us a little video clip of one of my favorite movies. I watched it again this week, uh, The Hobbit. Uh, and I've used this clip before, but I absolutely love it because it captures so much what I think the tension that a lot, of, a lot of us live in day to day. It's the tension between safety and adventure. And in this clip, Bilbo Baggins, if you don't know the story, he's a hobbit who's being recruited by a group of dwarfs who are going to try to go and t retake their homeland, which, is being, uh, which was taken from them by this dragon, Smog. And, uh, and so he's considering it, he's weighing the options, and, uh, and he's overwhelmed. And then you also see him wake up the following day, realizing that the rest of them have left on the adventure, and he's left behind. So go ahead and roll it. I love that. It's, it's as he's come to realize, all right, the adventure's leaving him, and he has a choice. Uh, he can either join the others in the adventure, or he can stay home. And it's this tension that I think a lot of us really do wrestle through. It's this idea of, am I going to embrace safety in my comfort zone, or am I going to embrace the adventure that God might have for me? Uh, now, here's another tension. Maybe you felt this or thought this in the past, or maybe it was just me. But I remember growing up as a Christian kid. I, I gave my life to Christ when I was five years old, and I grew up in a Christian home. And I remember thinking this idea. Idea, and the idea was this, that if I follow Jesus, I'm embracing the boring life. I, that's what I believed, because everyone else, like, everyone else gets to have all the fun. And I'm going to have to do all the right things, which means I won't have any of the fun. Anyone else believe that? Okay, uh, probably some of you, even if you never really thought about it, you're like, I did think that about those Christians <laughs> uh, while you were having all the fun. Uh, no, but, but really, I, I, what I actually have come to believe that is true is that um, I, I bought a lie from the enemy uh, of this lie that as a Christ follower, you can't have the adventurous life. See, I find that the enemy always uh, sells a lie that's the exact opposite of the truth. What if I told you, and I firmly believe it now today, that the best and most adventurous life is actually found with Jesus? It, it's found walking with him. That actually he's called us to a life of adventure. He's called you to this. Some of you are like, I don't know, I still think it's boring. And then you've missed it. You've missed something. And so I really want to help us to hopefully unpack some things today of why you might have missed it and then how we can join God in uh, the life of adventure. I want to read a passage uh, to you that we actually read at the very beginning, week one of The Calling. We read this passage looking at how the disciples um, first followed Christ. And we looked at it through the lens of really what Jesus was calling the disciples to. He was calling them to a life to follow him, be changed by him, and commit their lives to the mission that he had for, for their lives. Uh, but today I want to look at it through the lens of adventure and some elements that all of us will have to kind of face. You're going to have to come face to face with these exact same elements if you're going to consider joining God in uh, the adventurous life. So let me read the passage of scripture to you again, and then we'll unpack it through the lens of uh, these elements of adventure. Matthew chapter 4, verse 
18 through 20, it says this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. So now, I believe that right now, right here in this moment, they experience the tension. I know you and I don't really feel it, but if you can imagine right now, they're like, oh, it's the tension is, is right now in this moment that they have to wrestle through. Are they going to embrace life as it's always been as fishermen, or are they going to embrace the life of adventure with Jesus? Now, why do I say that there's a, a tension? Um, well, if I were to kind of break down the calling to adventure, let's consider that there's a few elements that all of us have to face, the disciples had to face it as well, right now in this moment. The first element that we all are going to have to face is this. It's the obstacle of the banal. At least that's how I would describe it. The obstacle, so you've got something between you. Uh, it's the obstacle of overcoming the banal. If you're wondering what in the world is banal, banal is a simple definition is this. It's so lacking in originality as to be obvious or boring. Another way of describing it would be the obstacle of everyone is doing it. Or maybe you'd say it this way, it's the way I've always done it. Or it's the way that I'm comfortable living life. So it's the obstacle of your own comfort zone. Are you tracking with me? The, the, the obstacle that you have to overcome of your own personal safety net. My life is so repetitive that it's almost obvious or boring. Don't elbow the person beside you. <laughs> if you're like, that's you. <laughs> so for these guys, they had uh, their own banal life, if you will, they, they had, that they had to overcome. In verse 18, we find out what they did for a living. And it says, they were what? There's a lot more of you here. They were what? Very good. All right. Talk back to me when I ask you a question. I appreciate that. They were fishermen. Right. So they were fishermen. Now, now fishermen, it wasn't like a dishonorable trade in Jesus' day, but it also wasn't a glamorous trade. Uh, it, it was sometimes really bad, long hours. We're actually going to find out when they were fishing here in just a minute. Uh, it was a smelly job. It was unpredictable in terms of the unpredictable conditions, often getting caught in storms, maybe even uh, life-threatening at times, low pay. It was survival work. No one goes into this line of work going, we're getting ready to throw. Thrive! You know, it's survival work, not thriving work. Uh, it was probably very mundane for them. Are, are you aware? It really never changed. Like, it's, we throw out the nets, and we wait. We gather the nets, and we clean them. You know, it's, it's what it was. Never probably too challenging. Uh, it was ongoing work. I don't know if you've ever had a job like that, a job where you could just dial it in and really not even think twice about what you were doing because you're just, it's so easy. I remember one night or one, one day in one of my jobs I had, I had to weed whack. The, the boss had said, hey, go on out there and weed whack. Uh, all of that, it was like high grass, like this high. And I looked at it, it was just, it was forever. It was like, I mean, a quarter mile worth of weed whacking. And he's like, you'll be doing that for a couple days. And so literally, you do this for, for hours. You, your brain kind of shuts off. You start thinking about other things, having conversations out loud. You know, and you're just like, and, and you're not even thinking about what you're doing until I'm like weed whacking down the neighbor's yard. You know, and no, those type of moments, maybe you've had those where you're just like, you can dial it in. You don't even have to be present. That's probably a little bit of some of the moments of, for these guys as as fishermen is that they've just gotten kind of caught in the safety of the mundane. Now, while Matthew, you got to remember that these accounts that we read of Jesus's life, they are captured and written down by multiple of his followers, okay? So we refer to these as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four guys who write really a biography, each of them, of Jesus's life and the account. Matthew captures this moment really succinctly, Luke actually fills it in a little bit more and gives us a little bit more of what else happened here uh, to help us go, oh, wow, this, this was really uh, pretty significant. So I want to read to you out of the book of Luke, okay? Luke chapter 5, verse 1, same encounter, but a little bit more around it. It says this, one day, as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. 
He got into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, Simon Peter, same guy. They just referred to him as Simon, sometimes just as Peter, and asked him to put out a little further from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Okay, now, here's something that's just interesting. So uh, about this encounter here, as Jesus is getting ready to call these guys to follow them, is that they were fishermen. They've been fishing all night. They are cleaning their nets right now. They haven't caught anything. And when Jesus asked them to put out their nets again, what he's actually challenging them is he's challenging them in the thing that they are good at. Are you aware of this? He's challenging them in the thing that they do every day. I can imagine that as, as the rabbi, so Jesus who grew up as a carpenter and is now functioning basically as a rabbi and teaching people, that he comes up to him and he says, hey guys, I want you to let out your nets again. Can you imagine that these guys might be like, hey, you were a carpenter? We are fishermen. Yeah, it was a bad night last night. But we're fishermen, like this is our gig, this is our thing, we're good at this, and now you're telling us to let our, out our nets again. Now on top of that, you've got to realize they've been cleaning their nets and getting them all ready, you know, sorting them out, cleaning out all the seaweed that they captured. When Jesus asked them to let out their nets, not only is he stepping into a place that they are good at, it's their norm, it's their place of expertise, He's also asking to complicate their lives a little bit more because he's saying, throw out the nets you just cleaned, and now I'm going to ask you to have to clean them again. Yay! Yeah, I can imagine if you're the, uh, these disciples, these fishermen, are like, I don't like this little request that you're asking of me. And here's what I found uh, is true, is that when we face the obstacle of the banal, this is often what it will feel like. This, it'll be like this. This is what I know. This is my life. This is my norm. This is my comfort zone. And now it's being called into question or Jesus is asking me to mix things up. And that's exactly what he's asking these disciples to do. Like, this is their comfort zone. This is what they're good at. This is what they know really well. And he's asking them to mix it up. Do something that doesn't make any sense to them. And so Simon Peter is being called to do something with his norm that's outside of his comfort zone. I remember a handful of years ago, this is probably almost 15 years ago, my wife and I, we lived in Joliet, Illinois. I was uh, a youth pastor at the time. I, was, I totally forgot. She was sharing earlier how she was six months pregnant standing between two gangs. That's just hilarious to me. I was standing between two gangs like every month. Uh, always stopping them, and I would come home, and I'd say, babe, I'm going to get shot one of these weeks. Um, but I, I was, this was, uh, sorry, not connected to the story at all. Let's get back to what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I was laughing when she said that. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was crazy. Um, but there was, we had built a house, actually, in Joliet. And uh, at the time, we had four children, and the house was perfect size for our family. And I remember one day I was praying, and I felt like the Lord told, told me, just impress it upon my, heart, upon my heart, you need to sell your house. And, and I was wrestling with God with that. I was like, that's a bad idea. God, we just built this house. Like, we picked everything ourselves. We picked the the blueprints. We picked out every color. We we picked the carpeting. We we built, it was awesome, and we loved it. It fit our family perfectly, and and I was just kind of like, this makes no sense, but I felt like the Lord had asked me to to do that. And uh, so I come to Lisa, and I said, Lisa, um, I feel like the Lord is calling us to to sell our home. And she's like, that's, that's, not God. He's not asking us to do, that was a bad burrito you ate, which by the way, I love burritos, and so if you ever want to make me really happy, bring me a burrito. Um, But (laughs) as she's like arguing with me, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I agree with you. It must have been a bad burrito, because I don't want to really leave our house either, because here's the crazy thing. I didn't have another job lined up. I didn't have another house lined up. There was like no other plan on the other side of it, and yet what the Lord was doing is he was calling into question our comfort zone, the thing that made sense to us. It was our norm. It was like our security blanket, and all of a sudden, the Lord is saying, I want you to sell it, and so it made no sense, and so when Lisa's like, no, that's not from God. I hate that. 
<laughs> I was like, me too. I'm with you. <laughs> so a couple months go by, and then one day we're driving home from church, and she's tearing up in the passenger seat. And I go, what's wrong? And she goes, we have to sell the house. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? She's like, during worship to the, today, the Lord just impressed on my heart that we have to sell the house. And I was like, okay. And so here's what was crazy about that is once again, we didn't have a different job. We weren't leaving. I didn't have another home. I didn't have any, it just made no sense, but we put the house on the market. My parents probably thought we were crazy. Our friends probably thought we were crazy. Uh, we thought we were a little bit crazy, but we were walking in obedience. Now our house didn't sell for over a year and a half, but it, I don't think the Lord was concerned about uh, making it happen in that moment. I think he was more concerned about our obedience. And in fact, there came a point when he sold it right at the right time. It was exactly the moment. It was like the month before the, the, the market crashed and our house would have lost its value like in huge ways. That, I mean, it was like God's perfect timing. But here's the deal is that uh, God may not be calling you to sell your house or move to Africa, but he might. Or he may call you to downsize or to simplify or to change jobs or maybe sell something or remove some activity. But here's what I do know he will do, is that he will shake up your norm. He wants to get in and disrupt what is the banal of your life. What is so normal, consistent, almost boring. And he's, it's the place where you're comfortable and you might even be the expert and he's going to step right into it and say, yeah, that thing. Cast out your nets. I know you're a fisherman. I know you know this thing. But I'm going to ask you to do something that makes absolutely no sense. All of us are going to have to face this. If you really genuinely want to join God in the adventure, you're going to have to face the obstacle of your own comfort zone of the banal. Second thing that you're going to have to face is this, or that you'll usually be given. God will give this to you. It's a sweet gift. It's a vision of dangerous wonder. Or a vision for adventure, I might call it. In verse 19, this is how it's described, at least as, as far as how Jesus calls the disciples. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, in that statement, you have kind of two elements. You have an invitation and a proclamation. The invitation, he says, come and follow me. Now, to us, we think, and we're like, all right, so Jesus is just asking these guys to come and follow him. But you've got to understand, this is Jewish culture. And in Jewish culture, when the rabbi asks you to come and follow him, that's a big deal. In fact, I want you to just imagine whoever you, I know we're not supposed to have idols, but let's imagine that you have an idol, someone that you idolize. Maybe it's a rock star or a, or a movie star or something like that. Whoever your star is, if they were to come up to you and say, hey, well, you want to join my posse? And you'd be like... Yes, I do. <laughs> That's how these guys would have felt. They would have been like, it's the rabbi who would have been the rock star of the day, inviting them to join his posse. For them, that was a really sweet invitation. Then on top of that, so he's got an invitation and a proclamation. The proclamation is, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, here's the crazy thing about that, is that when he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, there is nowhere in their entire culture or community that they're like, I know what that is. None of them, there, there's no like job description. They're like, I know what a fisherman is, but fishers of men. Sounds intriguing. Let me go Google that, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, they have no idea. But here's why I believe that, it, that as he says it, it's this invitation or proclamation to a dangerous calling, a dangerous adventure. It's because of what else happens in this moment. So let's pick it up in Luke, okay? Luke chapter 5, which I think will help you understand like, oh, why these guys, while they might not have known what the job description of a fisher of men is, they were ready to go after it. And notice what it says in Luke 5 verse 6. It says, when they'd done so, remember, he asked them to let out their nets, so they do that. They go out, out into deep water. When they let out their nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. Now here, notice what happens here. The miraculous collides with the banal. That's what happens. The miraculous, the kingdom of God collides 
with their norm, with their, their comfort zone, the thing that they're good at in life, what is always boring and normal, all of a sudden got crazy. That's what happened. I, I, I love it here. It's, it's, it's always been fishing, but fishing just got real. Fishing just got crazy. Fishing just took it up a level in huge ways when we followed Jesus' command. And this is what I found to be true in my own life, is that usually the Lord is not calling you to quit your job. Some of you are like, whew, good. Or move from your home. Some of you are like, whew, good. Or abandon everything in your life. But what I do believe the Lord always wants to do is bring the craziest miraculous into your job, into your home into your family, into your regular banal life. He actually wants to collide the kingdom right in those places. Uh, When we go out to Montana, that's where my wife is from. She grew up in Glacier National Park, uh, Montana. Whenever we go on out there, we have something that we call, it's kind of become a family uh, tradition or phrase, joke almost, we call them uh, epic adventures. And it goes back probably 20 some years. There was a, a Christmas break one year uh, that we were out, out there and um, we got snowed in and there was nothing to do. And so we're all just sitting around and I decided, I said, guys, let's, let's go hop in a car. Let's drive into the park, Glacier National Park, and let's drive until we get stuck. And we're like, and I was like, epic adventure. And that's basically what happened. And so we all hopped in the car, and we just drove until we got stuck. And we took shovels, and we're like, we're just going to go on roads that haven't been plowed, and we'll go. And, we, and when we got home, people were like, what did you guys do? And we said, we went on an epic adventure. We didn't just go driving. We drove till we got stuck. And so for us, every time we're out in Montana, we still do the same thing. Like, we don't just go fish from the bridge. At the end, we jump off the bridge into the river. When when we're floating, we don't just go float the river, we jump off the cliffs into the river. When we go down to the river uh, and and go drive down there, we don't just drive down there, we get the van stuck in the river. I mean, that's what, it was awesome. It was so awesome having, like, I think seven of my kids pushing our 15-passenger van that was stuck (laughs) in the riverbed. But we got it out. It was so awesome. And I was like, like, epic adventure. So good. But it's not always something new. It usually ends up being something that is God-ordained or God-ordained adventure colliding with your mundane. It's just, it's what you already do in life, but discovering how God actually wants to meet you in the midst of it and bring adventure to it. Um... I remember I've told this story before, but let me just share it again because it's just such a good idea of how God often does this. Uh, This is probably 10 years ago. I was at a gym and I was working out. And so I'm lifting weights. I was curling, okay? So I'm curling dumbbells like this. And I'm staring in the mirror, curling dumbbells. And this guy grabs dumbbells next to me and he starts curling as well. And we start curling in sync, literally. Now, there's nothing manly about curling in sync with another guy. Like, synchronized weightlifting, it's not a thing. It should never be a thing. <laughs> and, we're, and as we're curling in sync, I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, and finally we just start busting up laughing because we're like, this looks ridiculous. And if anyone looks at us, they're all going to start making fun of us. And so we started laughing. I, I asked him a little bit about uh, him and his life. I found out he was engaged to this gal. They, she had some kids, he had some kids. They were about to get married. And together they were going to have five kids. And we at the time had six, and so I was like, so we had a little bit of common ground there. And, and I asked him, I said, what do you do uh, kind of in life? And he told me his job, and he said, you know, I do this, this is my job. Then I, I come here to the gym, then I go home, watch TV, go to bed, wash, rinse, repeat. Same thing. Tomorrow, work, gym, wash TV. It's life. He goes, what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor. He goes, why? <laughs> and I said, Well, because I believe there's a whole lot more to life than just going to work, going to the gym, and watching TV, wash, rinse, repeat. And I started talking about Jesus and walking with him and how Jesus brings adventure into our lives and how life is just, can be lived to the full with God. And his kind of ears perked up and his eyes, brows raised. And about a month later, he and his fiance were sitting in church at our church. 
And I remember it was probably a month or two after that. I remember the day that I gave people an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And he and his fiance looked up at me and, and responded to Christ. See, it was just weightlifting. But it turned into just a mini epic adventure. And this is what God is looking to do. He's looking to have the kingdom of God collide with your mundane, with the banal in your life. If you're willing to look for it, if you're willing to join him in it. Uh, there's something, I think, for these guys, for the fishermen here, that there's something in the call from God that they probably didn't understand. When Jesus is saying, hey guys, you want to be fishers of men? They're probably like, I don't know what that means. But all I know is that our, our nets are tearing, our boats are sinking. This is crazy, and you're inviting me on an adventure with you. I don't know what fisher of men means, but I'm in. And the Lord is doing the same thing for each and every one of us. He actually wants the miraculous to collide with your regular, and then he's going to stare at you and say, hey, do you want to join me? I've got a calling upon your life. You're going to say, I don't even know the definition of the calling and what you're calling me to, but I'm in. And I believe he wants to invite you into that type of adventure. I would bet that most all of us have experienced at some point in our life kind of this stirring within our hearts toward adventure with God or toward something he's calling you to. And maybe you just haven't moved toward it. Sometimes we've talked about simplifying our lives, but sometimes it is about adding things to our lives. Maybe the Lord is calling you to actually get involved in coaching a team or uh, being involved in the PTO at school, or maybe building a relationship with a neighbor, or serving in the junior high ministry. That's a calling. Maybe even last week as I was talking about, about uh, how we can serve here, and how every person here is important to the body, as, as God describes it in his word, is that we're, we function like a body, and if we're... If, if you're not serving where you're supposed to be, it might be like a, a body that's missing a hand, that it's just not all there, and we want all of us to get serving where we're supposed to be serving. If something stirred within you last week and you didn't take that next step to just find out how could I start the serving process, go directly outside these doors before you leave here today. Uh, the serving tables are still set up there. We would love to help you take a step in getting on a team here serving the people at the church or the children here at the church or people even outside the church here through our ministries. And so just swing by those tables before you leave. But here's the deal. You're all going to have to face the obstacle of the banal. There will be an invitation to a dangerous wonder, a vision for dangerous, uh, uh, or, or for a dangerous uh, adventure. And then third, there will always be this, and this is the hardest one. There's a cost of wild abandonment. Some of you guys, as soon as you face this one, you're going to say, I'm out. And honestly, I pity I feel bad that your heart is so connected to something from this world that you'll miss out on joining God in something from his world. Because your heart is connected with something from this kingdom versus his kingdom. But there's something you have to face. It's the cost of wild abandonment. For these guys in verse 20, it says this, at once they left their nets and they followed him. Now you got to understand, as they leave their nets, this is not like I left a $10 fishing pole and my bait and tackle down by the boathouse. This is, they left their livelihood. They left their security blanket. They left their ability to provide for themselves. And they leave it all behind. Not only that, these guys, uh, they are walking away from probably the biggest payday they've ever seen. They're, they're walk this would have been like winning the lottery. They've had such a big catch that their nets are breaking. They've filled two boats that their boats are sinking. Um, uh, they're, they're walking away from the catch of a lifetime. This is the biggest payday they've ever had. And they're like, listen, to follow you, we'll walk away from it. For them, they're, it's more than just following him. They're actually putting their trust in him. They're saying, I'm going to trust you over this amazing provision that is right in front of me. All my supplies and all of these fish. I'm going to trust you to follow you. And uh, for all of us here, this is going to be one of the biggest hurdles that you and I have to face is this element of trust as well. 
See, it, there will cost you something, and you're going to have to say, am I going to trust him, or am I going to trust the things that I've always put my trust in? Whether that thing is yourself, or your, uh, or your finances, or your ability to get by in life. But for some of you right now, you trust in one person. That is yourself. You've been hurt, you've been left, maybe no one else has been consistent in your life, maybe no one else is providing for you, and I don't blame you for that perspective of only trusting in yourself, that you're the only person that up till this moment you felt like you could rely on, but I want to promise you there's someone who you actually can rely on. His name is Jesus. He's trustworthy, and the reason why I know he's trustworthy is that in your sin and in my sin, he said, I'm going to lay down my life for you to pay the price of sin. Scripture says that the, the wage of sin, the price of sin is death. That's a payment you and I can't pay. It's too steep for us, and God knows it, and so he said, uh, I'm going to send my son to lay down his life willingly for you at the cross. And so he laid down his life for you and I, and he's saying, if you would put my... Put your trust in what Jesus did at the cross and follow me. We can join him in the same adventure that he invites these disciples uh, into. But it takes this step of wild abandonment. You have to abandon trust in yourself and put your trust in him. And this is the defining moment. It's really it's the difference between belief and trust. Sometimes we think of those words, belief and trust, and we think of them as being the same, but they're very different. I, I picture it like this, standing at the top of a bridge where they've got a bungee cord hooked up, and if I held up the bungee cord and you say, do you believe that this bungee cord will hold you if uh, you're strapped to it and you jump off this bridge? Do you believe it? And you go, oh yeah, I believe it. Okay, I'm hooking you up. Jump. You're like, no, I'm out. See, it's one thing to say, I believe that the bungee cord will work, and it's another thing to put my trust in the bungee cord and jump. And some of you have said, I believe that Jesus did something significant. I don't know, I, I can't wrap my head fully around it, but I believe that he did something on the cross. I believe that there was something in that moment. I believe it, but in terms of are you going to put your trust in Jesus, you're sitting there going, I don't know, and yet he's the only one who's trustworthy, and there will be a cost to following him. I don't want to pretend like it doesn't cost you something. It does cost you something, but it, it costs you this, I'm going to rely on myself. I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to rely on him now. I'm going to trust in him, and I'm going to jump. It could cost you other things as well. It could cost you this idea of, uh, of prestige or power or relationships, opportunity. I, I remember when Lisa and I took the job here at Lakeland. It was uh, kind of a, a moment of facing the cost of wild abandonment. I had, it was a kind of a crazy moment, uh, my previous church that I was at, I was an associate pastor, and they offered me the job as the senior pastor. Two days after Lakeland offered me the job as senior pastor. And it was absolutely, it was a, it was a kind of a mind-boggling moment, because my other church was actually about four or five times the size of Lakeland at the time. When I came here, um, I was the only staff member. It was me and the secretary. And, and it was uprooting my family, selling our home, coming to a place all, you know, by ourselves, um, no staff, and just starting. And honestly, there's nothing that made sense about the move. And yet the Lord made it really clear upon our heart, this is where we're supposed to come. And so we had to literally just kind of walk away from everything that made sense, sell the house, leave all the relationships, leave the larger church, leave all that behind and come here to Lakeland. And yet there was a cost. It was a very real cost. It didn't make any logical sense. But for some of you, you can relate to that where you know there's something you got to like, you got to sacrifice. There's a cost that, that there will be. And all you've got right now is the call. You've got this call that's stirring within you. It stirs within your heart. You don't even know what it means. It's just like Jesus calling the disciples, hey, want to be fishers of men? They're like, I don't know what it means, but I'm in. And, and you're, you're, you're like that. I want to invite you guys as well. If you feel like you're standing on the edge of the high dive, and you haven't taken the leap, stop standing. It's time to go on an epic adventure and jump in with Jesus. I think my favorite line out of the movie clip today, and probably out of that whole movie, is when Gandalf looks at Bilbo, or, or when Bilbo actually looks at Gandalf and says, can you promise that I'm going to come back from this adventure? And Gandalf says to him, no, and if you do, you will not be the same. 
If you go on this adventure with Jesus, you will not be the same. While I was standing back, uh, back off to the side here during that final song before I took, before I came up here on the stage, I felt like the Lord has impressed something on my heart that's very specific to some of you in this season of life. And it's, it, I, so I want to speak to those of you who are on the latter half of your life. And you feel like, how do I engage in the adventure with God when my assets have grown, my position is secure, everything, the key to life, and in, and in fact, my financial advisor is saying, stay steady, don't mix things up. How do I go on the adventure with God on the latter half of my life? And I just want to say very specifically to you, it is not too late to join God in the adventure. It is not too late to take the leap of faith and to jump off the high dive and go on an adventure with God. I, I really feel like there's some of you who that is holding you back. And, and I, I just want you to imagine for a moment that God <laughs> would come to you and say, let's imagine that you don't have any of your stuff, any of your assets, any of your, your positional power. But I'm inviting you to come with me. Do you want to come? Just answer the simple question, yes or no. And if you say yes, then find out what the, then he's going to speak something up. Now here's what it will cost you. But don't let what you've built keep you from what he's going to build in and through you in his kingdom and with him, joining him. I believe it's something really powerful. It's just going to just absolutely transform you. But some of you have written off the idea that you can join him in the latter half of your life. And you, it's not too late. It's time. All right. I got to end. I got to land the plane. Let's close here in prayer. Let's stand. Would you guys just stand with me and we'll close in prayer. <clears throat> We have a phrase here. I, I want to almost say it's become a Lakeland-ism. And it was a total accident. I know it was a total accident when it came out of this man's mouth. But the guy who was the interim pastor uh, here at Lakeland before I got here was Mike Flick. Mike, he oversees our Celebrate Recovery ministry. He was one of our overseers for the last you know, decade. And the night that I told Mike that I would accept the position here at Lakeland, he told me this. It was a phrase that just kind of rolled off his tongue. I think it was a complete, an accident, a complete accident, but it has become the phrase that I think marks this church. He said, I want to go out with my guns blazing. Well, Mike's in his 70s, and he is going out with his guns blazing. I don't know how many years. I got more than Mike. <laughs> I don't know how many years I got left, but every one of them, I want to go out with my guns blazing. It'll be risky, it'll be scary, but man, what a church could do if we all said, I don't know if this is my last year, but I'm going out with my guns blazing for him. I believe he could do amazing things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person here. I know the call upon our lives is not a boring one. It is one of adventure. Yeah, we're going to have to face the things that are our comfort zone. You're going to put in place within us a vision for dangerous wonder. And then we're going to have to face the cost of following you. But Lord, I pray for every person here that if we've been on the edge and we just have been so afraid to jump off and follow you, that that would no longer be the case. That today we would say, I'm joining you in the adventure that you have for us. Whether I've got one week left or one year left or ten years left, I'm going out with my guns blazing. And I want to join you in the great adventure that you have for my life. We pray this now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. We got prayer partners back here. We'd love to pray with you if any prayer needs. Grab Operation Christmas Child boxes. Go to the serve table if you're not serving. Be blessed. Have a great week.